Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to um, one of the Wilton E. Scott Institute for Energy Innovations uh, webinar series. Um, today, we're taking, uh, I'm Jay Whitaker. I'm the director of the Energy Institute, and it's a real pleasure. We have, a, I think, a really high uh, amount of interest in this topic, and it's great that all of you have tuned in to, to learn more and to see our uh, very esteemed panel go through um, this topic. Uh, the title of today is Tackling Energy Poverty, Domestic and International Strategies, Challenges and Insights. Um, I don't want to prolong this anymore, but just to say we all understand all the recent events around uh, uh, the equity issues and the poverty issues and especially issues surrounding black Americans has really uh, impacted us all. And we at the Energy Institute are trying to figure out what things matter and how to make sure that we are doing things that are full of action that last a long time um, and that are going to create a change in culture that is going to be you know a sustainable real thing uh, going forward. Uh, I'm going to let Anna, the executive director of the institute, take over from here. But I just wanted to quickly uh, step in and just uh, you know provide a face uh, or at least a voice to this um, as the leader of the institute. It's important to me that that. Uh, we are represented in this uh, important topic, and uh, I just, I'm glad you're all tuned in, and I'm looking forward to uh, this great webinar. So, Anna, please take over. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Um, as Jay mentioned, um, you are now uh, a part of this webinar series that we're, uh, we're doing. Um, this is the sixth in a series, and we'll talk a little bit about it. First, I did want to um, tell you a little bit about the Scott Institute and this webinar uh, series. So the Scott Institute is a hub for energy related activities and research at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we are very um, involved with collaborative research, uh, creating partnerships, uh, thinking about policy, which is uh, kind of at the heart of what we're doing today. Um, thinking about how entrepreneurs um, can get their important ideas out and, of course, educating our students. So this webinar, uh, which we started back in March, uh, we've been getting together twice a month, a um, couple of times more than that. Uh, but we really are focusing on informative dialogues that can help with key decision making. And so when we talk about this particular topic, uh, we're glad to see so many of you um, interested in this work. So today, as Jay mentioned, we're talking about tackling energy poverty, uh, domestic and international strategies, challenges, and insights. Um, I want to give you uh, first a big thank you for being here. Thank you not only to our panelists, um, to Jay for joining us, um, but also to all of you. Uh, we know that you have a lot of things uh, that are pressing in your lives. Uh, and there are a lot of people that are on the front line that are doing very, very important work right now. We just want to say thank you to all of them and to all of you. We do have additional webinars that are coming up in the very new future. Um, we have a group of investors that is coming together on July 23rd to talk about um, how to keep ideas and innovations flowing even in a time of pandemic. Um, in early August on the 6th, we'll be talking about transportation energy with a real focus and lens on energy um, access and equity. And then finally, um, at the end of August, uh, we'll be talking about batteries and storage. So we're really looking at a, how to create a, uh, an equitable, renewable future. Um, all of this information exists on our website. Uh, we hope that you'll register and attend those. We will continue uh, the months after that. Uh, as soon as we have the September topics uh, pulled together, we will be posting those as well. So we have uh, three esteemed guests this morning, and I want to do a, sort of a quick walkthrough of their bios, and then I'm going to put all of our pictures live. In fact, why don't I pull, I'll put our pictures live now. Something to share. All right, here we are. So, um, Dr. Paulina Jaramillo is a professor of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University. She's the co-director of the Green Design Institute at CMU, a fellow of the Energy Institute for Energy Innovation and Research at Carnegie Mellon, and a research affiliate of the Kigali Collaborative Research Center. She also holds a courtesy appointment at CMU Africa. 
Um, Pro Professor Hermillo is the lead author for the IPC's sixth assessment report as part of the working group number three. And over the past five years, her research and educational efforts have focused on issues related to energy access and development in the global south. Thank you, Paulina. Uh, our second guest today is also from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Destiny Nock is an assistant professor in engineering and public policy, as well as civil and environmental engineering at Carnegie Mellon. Her research is focused on applying optimization and decision analysis tools to evaluate the sustainability, equity, and reliability of power systems in the United States and Sub-Saharan Africa. And she's also an energy fellow with the Scott Institute. Um, and last but not least, Tony Reams is the assistant professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability and the director of the Urban Energy Justice Lab at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He's also a, a, JBP, a JPB Foundation Environmental Health Fellow in the T.H. Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. His research focuses on the production and persistence of spatial racial and socioeconomic disparities in energy accessibility and affordability. So thanks all of you for being here this morning. So I want to go ahead and jump right into our topics. And um, just as a note to everyone, we do have a question uh, area, a Q&A area. Please use that one instead of the chat feature. Um, it's much easier for us to keep track of the questions if you put them in that Q&A area. So again, welcome to all of our esteemed panelists this morning. I want to start with sort of a general question for all of you. Um, and I'm hoping that each of you can weigh in. As we go through these questions, there'll be some that you uh, are more interested in answering, and that's totally fine. So the question is, when talking about COVID-19 and other disruptions in 2020, so details about equity issues related to energy access and energy poverty have really moved to the surface. Can you talk about some of the particular issues that you've seen come into focus? And why don't we start with Tony, uh, then we'll go to Destiny and Paulina if you'd like to answer as well uh, at, the, at the end. So Tony. Great. Thank you, Anna, and good morning, everyone. Um, I wanna start with this question just kind of focusing on what we knew pre-COVID and pre-2020. Um, the last residential energy consumption survey from the Energy Information Administration uh, taught us that one in three households face this uh, energy insecurity or this inability to uh, affordably use energy, pay for energy, um, keeping their home at an unhealthy temperature or either making the heat or eat decision between you know, heating their home or eating um, or buying food to eat. And so we know that you know, people were already living, 33% of Americans were living in energy insecurity. Um, and I think kind of the, the economic toll of the coronavirus pandemic um, amplified that or exacerbated that. And so trying to figure out how do we use this moment to actually address energy poverty that has persisted over time before pandemic and how to make people more resilient um, during a pandemic, particularly in communities of color who suffer from um, housing affordability issues, poor quality housing. Um, and so I think the, the connection between energy housing, dealing with a public health pandemic and an economic crisis has highlighted um, those disparities more. So, so one of the things that I have seen come more in, to the surface would be this thought about the compounding effects of poverty. So a lot of times if you're experiencing energy poverty, you're also experiencing food insecurity and you might also be experiencing economic insecurity. And so this kind of thought of needing to work at the intersection of these problems as opposed to being in our own silos has become like a lot more in like the forefront. Um, so for example, like if people now, people now have to like educate their kids at home. And so then you have like the school lunch issue combined with needing a computer, combined with needing an internet at home, plus a lot of people who still have to go into work and have like these health, health risks. So I think that there's this, you know, there's a lot more talk now about like intersections and collaborations and um, this intersectionality of these issues. Excellent. And Paulina? Um, yeah, I think so. I think the discussion about, I don't think the, the discussion about 
there are people like Tony who think a lot about energy equity in the U.S. in the context of the U.S., but it hasn't been at the forefront of the discussions on the energy in the energy uh, community. Uh, when we talk about energy equity, in at least in my circles, it is really very focused on outside of the U.S. energy equity outside of the U.S. When the reality is we have energy poor people, energy insecure people in the U.S., and so I think that COVID may be helping highlight just to highlight those issues a little bit more and bring them to the forefront um, a little bit more. So the next question, um, are we seeing a shift in the social costs of energy? So, and if so, in what ways? So what do you all see is happening as a result of, you know, curtailed energy bills that are now coming due in this hottest part of the year? You know, it's interesting, particularly as here in Pennsylvania, we also have an issue with rent um, coming up as well. So not only energy, but rent and whether or not that's going to be extended. So what are some thoughts on that? So Destiny, I think maybe we'll start on that one and then Paulina next. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing in the shifts in social costs of energy is this redistribution of the employer who might have once paid for the bulk of meeting your energy needs during the hottest time of the day to now that's shifting in the residential sector. So now, you know, whereas like you might not have spent so much time like cooking meals at home, you might not have been running your AC as long, that's going to increase some of these like residential energy bills. Um, so there's like that concern there. And plus like now a lot more people are in their house for a lot longer. So you don't have kids going to school you know, people are trying to stay entertained. Um, just like for one example of like the social cost of being connected and being able to social distance um, in some rural communities, they did not have good internet access. Um, so like my parents just got like cable internet. And before that, we only one person could be on the computer at a time. And so, um, you know, that makes it really hard for two people to work from home. It makes it really hard for people to do their schooling from home and be on these webinars. So there's this like social cost of how much ability do you have to remain socially distanced? Whereas like you might've been able to go to a coffee shop before and now you're just kind of stuck. Right, stuck at home. So Paulina, yeah. I'm sure you have a lot in this area to talk about too. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the fundamental thing is that energy consumption during the day is shifting from workspaces to homes. Uh, and so we're seeing residential energy, electricity, energy consumption in general increasing. And so that has implications, with you're paying more for your electricity, but it isn't just that you're paying for more for your electricity. It's also that you're paying more for your electricity or for your energy. A largest share of your budget is going to energy at a time when your budgets are already strained because you're for low or you can't work full time. And so there's that double whammy there. Um, on rental issues, right, the other thing is, uh, when you, it's been shown that for rental properties, people don't have control over what appliances they have, what air conditioning they have, so they're typically more inefficient. So in addition, that also adds the burden of your appliances at home and at work, your air conditioning at home are more inefficient, which then also increases. It's not just that you're spending more time at home, but you're spending more time at home with inefficient appliances which also then it's like an additional burden on your energy consumption costs. Um, so I think it's just like this, it's that you're spending more time at home, so which increases your energy consumption because your, your appliances are less efficient and at a time where your budgets are already constrained. So that's a real challenge um, that we'll probably be seeing more and more. I mean, this week has been particularly hot in in, well, I was in Ohio most of this week and it was really hot. I think it's been very hot in Pittsburgh. So like this week we would, we're probably seeing those strain, like those, those communities being particularly strained with the heat and making decisions about how to balance their budgets under this heat. Yeah, you're right. Um, I'm sure that um, cooling centers are also an issue. Tony, do you have ideas about that? Yeah, thinking about expanding the kind of social impacts of this, um, many health departments around the country and local governments, you know, choose their cooling centers before um, the summer starts and puts those lists out. But what you've seen is some challenges because health departments, one, were already stressed with dealing with the health pandemic, um, which was taking most of their time. City governments are also losing revenue. So you have staff members that are furloughed. 
Um, but then the idea of are people even comfortable going to a cooling center? Um, a lot of places, particularly cold weather states, people don't have AC. And, and like Paulina said, it's been really hot this last week and this week as well. Um, I know Detroit just released their list of cooling centers. And so trying to decide how do you safely open schools back up? Libraries have been closed. How do you get people to go into a form of public spaces that aren't even open? Um, and then do social distancing um, for a population that may already be at high risk. And so I think some of the social challenges um, of this combination of, of weather, the inability or energy insecurity, not having proper heating and cooling in your home um, is still yet to be seen and something that we should definitely keep our eye on. Thanks for that. So next question. So most people uh, would have been working at a place outside of their home, um, as you all have mentioned. So are there other impacts that you're seeing at work that reflect this more clearly, most clearly? So are there similarities um, between nations on these issues? So are we seeing this in other parts of the world? Um, Tony, how about Tony and then Destiny first? Yeah, so I'll, um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, my work looking at energy efficiency implementation. Um, so this part of the year is when most of the programs are being rolled out. A lot of the energy efficiency retrofits are being done. But again, this issue of comfortability and safety going into people's homes. Um, so a lot of programs, both uh, government programs and utility funded programs were halted. And so what that means is that people who really needed these energy retrofits to either make their homes more comfortable, more efficient, save money, reduce energy, um, are now stuck with their inefficient homes for um, the foreseeable future. Um, but it is allowing, one, one positive note, it is allowing program implementers to kind of rethink and re-envision how they deliver these programs. And so people have talked about delivering some, you know, easy to do DIY self-installs to people's houses, doing a FaceTime call and trying to, you know, help grandma install a, a aerator on our shower or things like that. Um, but it but it does some of the more technical installations that need to be done and makes it more difficult to do that. So, um, so yeah, hopefully we can, you know, restart those programs in the near future, but people that really need them right now are unable to access them. So Destiny, can you share some insights on this? And then Paulina, maybe on the international front. Um, so one of the things that I've kind of been seeing is this big focus on making sure that electric, electrical development is really focused on productive uses of energy. Um, so, you know, in like Malawi, for example, they're largely dependent on tourism and that is like a piece of work that has to be done in person. And so then like when you kind of com combine this with like lacking internet infrastructure to have the ability to social distance and you know, you put that also in like an agricultural based like economy, there's just this like um, large economic insecurity that comes from not being able to really like deploy like e-commerce and make sure that people can still like be connected and have this like exchange of goods. And so you're also seeing that a little bit in the US, but kind of on the flip side of e-commerce, like actually like surging, right? And so now like you see a lot of people like getting things delivered there's a lot of talks about like, you know, can you use like autonomous vehicles, maybe combined with like electric vehicles to kind of like rethink like the electrification of the transportation sector, but for that productive use of like socially distanced, like food sourcing. And so now like people are really kind of changing the ways that we think about how we can use electricity to make sure that if people need, like if people are vulnerable, they don't have to go out. If people think that they're sick, they can actually stay in. And Paulina? Yeah, so on the international context, I mean, it, it, like global things are very different. So um, of course in developing countries, there are people that just cannot work from home, right? If you were like, there's a lot of places in Latin America and Africa and Asia where you have an informal economy, people have to go out on a day to day to leave. So, but that's a very, like that's a discussion about the systems, like the society, systemic issues with society. On the energy side and work in developing countries, um, um, there's also the challenge of people that could actually work from home. Are they actually able to work from home in developing countries? Um, there's issues of connectivity, right? If you don't have power, you don't have internet. And um, in many developing countries, for example, if you work in an office, your office building may have 
back up diesel generators that turn on if the power goes on. That may not be true at your home. So if you're working from, have to work from home and the power goes out, you lose internet, you can't, and if, if it's extended periods of time, you then lose charge of your computer. So it makes work in those settings, even for the people, a lot of people can't even work from home, but those that can work from home have that additional burden of unreliable power ser service or unreliable internet service. Um, in, in the tropical, like air conditioning is not as common in many places in the developing world, um, especially residential air conditioning. Office buildings may have air conditioning. Uh, and so if you work at an office building in a developing country, you may have air conditioning, which facilitates, I mean, there's e there is evidence that shows that higher temperatures re lead to reduce, re like uh, in your environment, lead to reduce pro productivity at work. So now you're shifting from offices that may have air conditioning to places where you can't have, where there isn't even air conditioning. That also has effects on productivity of the people that could stay at work. So a lot of the same things, I guess, similar to what we would see in the US, it's also we're also observing it in developing countries. So we have a question about solar and renewables, because it seems that in addition to energy efficiency and maybe upgraded home appliances, um, we could have been a little bit more ready. Um, solutions are there that we could have used that would al alleviate this residential energy burden. So, you know, have what should we have done to plan in a different way? Um, what did we not consider before that we should really be thinking about now as we're not only in the middle of this pandemic, but even as it continues? Um, how about Destiny and then maybe Tony? I know Paulina, you also have comments on this. Um, so one of the things that I've been thinking about in the Sub-Saharan Africa context is, again, this like thought about making sure that people can be comfortable in their residential environments. And so when we're kind of thinking about um, uh, with residential electrification, a lot of times like people immediately go to like lighting, for example. And so you might size the solar panel just to be big enough for lighting and a couple of cell phone charging. Um, but you know, we, we also have to consider like um, cleaning the indoor, like removing indoor air pollution. So that, that might involve changing like the stove that they use or adapting that system to accommodate for cultural differences. Um, so for example, in Ghana, a lot of people will, you know, cook right over the fire and sometimes it's in the home. So it makes it really hot and it makes it really smoky. And so then, um, you know, now some people are thinking about, well, actually, could we just like put like a venting fan on the roof to actually just pull out that air pollution? Um, and so, you know, they don't have to like change the way they're cooking, but it would reduce air pollution and it also could reduce like the temperature inside. And so kind of if we had thought about some of these things before to really just change the way that we are trying to electrify people, but also adhere to cultural norms, I think we could have seen like less of an impact in terms of like more people being home like during like really polluting times not being able to like go out to like the market to buy some food if they wanted to like have a break from that um and then additionally like a lot of hospitals in sub-saharan africa are lacking electrification which you know could really help with like ventilators that's very elect electric and electricity intensive um, and then like also thinking about like deploying this like internet infrastructure, like as, as we're deploying like electricity infrastructure to make sure that people can social distance. And I think that like solar and wind could really have helped in that area just because it's like localized generation. Right. So Tony. Yeah, great points, Destiny. Um, in my mind, uh, there is no energy justice without equitable access to the best available infrastructure, which includes renewables. Um, and again, before this moment, we, we know that there are racial disparities with black households being less likely to even have access to solar, um, low income households being less likely to have access to solar. And so again, these, these racial and economic disparities as well as some geographic disparities exist. Um, and how do we use this moment to understand those disparities to actually implement programs and policies that will address them. Um, if we can pass bills for $2 trillion um, that ends up going to wealthy donors versus people that really need it, um, we have the money to actually, uh, like Destiny say, do an electrification revolution in this country. Uh, we just wrapped up a DOE funded project um, working with 
NREL and um, University of Chicago and uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab to look at what is the solar potential for households that are occupied by low and moderate income households. And you see that about a third of the rooftop solar potential, you know, understanding that there will be roof quality issues and things like that and, and ownership issues. But a third of our rooftop potential is on houses that are occupied by low income households. And so we have the, the opportunity here to actually address, uh, you know, a holistic approach to people's uh, individual energy plans, whether that's combined solar with renewables and when batteries are less expensive, also add some storage. Um, and so again, I think if we have a policy window here in, in the next year, you know, is there an opportunity to really think about um, what elements of a Green New Deal can actually be implemented that make people more resilient um, during times like this, um, particularly when you have this combination of a public health crisis, an economic crisis, um, and a social equity crisis. So I have a, a follow on question to that um, that's actually come in from Dave Dezombach. Hold on, let me find that. Um, one of our faculty members. So he's saying that with COVID, the move to renewable energy in the United States has slowed considerably. So what are the impacts or benefits for this in terms of energy insecurity? And I think we've touched on that a little bit, but who would like to comment on that uh, important question? Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say one thing real quick. Um, you know, if you look at, especially the jobs numbers, you see large declines um, in, in the renewable energy sector. Um, and, you know, I think that's emblematic of just, you know, what parts of our economy have been viewed as essential. Um, but again, you know, if you can look at also energy efficiency, like I said earlier, you know, this, this idea of trying to rethink how do we safely deploy these technologies and in, in these programs, um, but again, I, I'm hopeful um, that that we do have a policy window and opportunity to actually, you know, jumpstart this. Um, I started this kind of energy equity work during the last recession, um, and it was because of the funding that was in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that um, kind of showed that we have an opportunity to recognize these, you know, dis energy disparities and address them with resources that could set people on a path to. Um, a more secure energy future. And so, um, yeah, while, while the numbers are, are, you know, dire now, I do think that there's, there's either going to be actions at the local and state levels, or we're going to have this kind of federal policy window to actually implement um, something. I think that um, one of the benefits of it slowing down is that it kind of highlights how people have not had equitable access before this thing happened. And it, in theory, provides a time for people to look back and ask, like, how can we make sure that um, we're doing it in a better way? So um, one of the things that, like, I've been thinking about recently is how, um, you know, you have, you, if you don't own your home, right, and you don't own your roof, it's very hard to get rooftop solar and benefit from that. Um, and so you're missing a large line of the low income populations. And also on top of that, there is this like economic barrier for the upfront cost of getting the panels and the battery system and maintaining it. Um, and so then on the flip side of that, outside of just not being able to like kind of adopt this technology, the more people that go off grid and get solar panels on their roof actually just raises the electricity price for everybody else that's still stuck on the grid because of the way that we pay for electricity, right? You only pay for the electrons that you use and people who have panels on their roof are actually getting the benefit of if their panels aren't working or the sun's not out then they have this reliability side that they get to connect whenever they want so they can jump on and off and you know we need to think about how we don't want low income or even just middle class or everybody who's not able to buy these panels we don't want them to be um, taking over that reliability burden because somebody has to pay for the poles, somebody has to pay for the wires, and somebody has to pay to fix all this stuff if any of it breaks. And that's not contingent upon how many electrons you're using um, at the time. Uh, Paulina? Yeah, so I mean, so first of all, I, I don't know where like the slowed out miserably information that Dave has. I don't, I don't know where he's getting that from. 
uh, globally in the first quarter of the year, we actually saw increases in renewable generation globally uh, compared to, to the same period in 2019. Um, and the IEA forecast for redu reductions in renewable deployments are mostly outside of the US and are mostly gonna be taking place in 2021. Um, like there's a lag, right? Because the projects that were shovel ready and are ready, they're, they've been able to continue with the problems, the, pro the projects that were upcoming that ha are being delayed because of supply chain disruptions and things like that. On the solar PV, it's actually an interesting, uh, I think there's an interesting situation going on then because I, I imagine everyone has heard about the duck curve, the solar duck curve, uh, which is a big problem with, particularly with rooftop solar PV. But with more people being at home, they are being able to use more, more of their own PV output. Uh, so the, the duck curve is actually like the value of the duck curve has like moved up, which has positive implications for, for, like for the integration of those renewables. It also affects net metering, um, the, the, the viability of net metering rules, which is where a lot of the cross subsidization is happening for for, for rough, rooftop CV, uh, PV. So there may actually be some benefits on, uh, associated with staying at home and having rooftop solar in those systems. The, the problem is that the people are benefiting from those are people that can afford the rooftop solar PV or can even have the roof to install, right? If you live in a rental building, you, you don't even have the ability so there are there may be some benefits there, but they're again distributed to the people that can access the, the solar PV resources at their home. <clears throat> so we have a, a lot of questions coming in. I appreciate everyone who's sending questions. I think we might actually have to answer some of these after in sort of an after, like a frequently asked questions after. I I want to continue down the, the path on solar, but I also think it's important for us to talk about air quality because energy generation, as we know, um, has a lot of environmental impacts. Solar renewables are would be better um, than some of the others. So can you talk a little bit about the air quality issues? I mean, it, we have a, sort of this uh, large and growing negative kind of normal times impact on urban communities. Um, it often um, is, you know, disadvantage, it, it's disadvantaging people in black and brown communities. So are we seeing any benefits in air quality with, you know, fewer cars on the road? Do we see more cars coming? Like, what are some of the thoughts that you have on air quality? And Paulina, if you'll start and then Destiny and Tony uh, will answer this question. And thank you again for all of the questions that are coming in. Yeah, so um, the air quality community is busy at work right now and uh, all of the data suggests that we have seen decreases in air pollution uh, in urban areas and most likely a reduction, a part of that is a reduction of, well, transportation related emissions, but also decreased um, industrial output. Um, and so especially transportation related emissions, which are, um, those, those emissions typically affect lower at lower income communities, that is a benefit. And there was a, a paper, a working paper in the, from the National Bureau of Economic Research um, that did an analysis and suggest that reductions in, in, or improvements in air quality as a result um, of, the, of the shutdowns have actually um, led to a decrease in air quality related mortality. Now, those benefits do not compensate for the mortality associated with COVID, which also, like COVID mortality is also um, um, affecting low, uh, black and brown communities more. Um, so the, the benefits of air quality do not make up for the health impacts of COVID, but there is, I mean, I think it will be interesting to see if there's any long-term uh, impacts we can see from these shifts in in the use of transportation. Our pe if people stay home more, like they, you get used to working at home, uh, and then you you decide to like it's clear now you can stay and work from home forever. Like, will that change travel behavior, and would that have long term implications for air quality? I think that's a long term question that there's no clear answer right now. It's a it's a whole webinar on its own. Yeah. Um, uh, destiny. 
Um, yeah, so right now, um, it, it is like you are seeing a really big decrease in air pollution. Um, but I think that, you know, there's this kind of concern about the rebound effect, because when people are able to start going back to work, um, a lot more people are hesitant to take public transport right now because of all of the like concerns about social distancing, the buses aren't going to be allowing as many people on. And so then you might end up having to wait for like two or three buses before you actually get one that's empty enough to take it. Um, and then, you know, there is this concern um, for like urban poor versus like rural energy poor. Um, and so we're seeing that there's a lot more um, like grocery delivery, like going on just in general. And so then there's like this kind of, um, so at least with Giant Eagle, they have this like new transport van that's kind of like picking up a bunch of groceries and then taking them to the middle um, and like trying to let people come in so that they can social distance so they don't have to go into the store. So this is reducing the number of one-way trips to the store, um, especially for people like in food deserts. I mean, in rural food deserts, you might be traveling like 30 minutes to get to a grocery store sometimes. Um, but, you know, this, if we have like a large increase in just like people ordering groceries like more often. Um, and so then like, instead of going to the store like once a week, you could actually see people just kind of ordering it like as they need it, like the Amazon effect. And so then you might actually see like air pollution associated with the sector rise. And then, you know, people now are, or companies are now thinking about just like the way to allow this kind of like um, Amazon type of food delivery. And so now they're like thinking about like lockers, right? And that's have, it's going to have like a large electricity need for like refrigerated lockers and refrigerated freezers. And you would need a lot of that infrastructure because like, you know, you have a lot of bulky items um, that you will pick up from the grocery store, especially if you only want to order like once a week or so. Um, and so then there's like this kind of like rethinking of how do we deliver food? How do we like change the way that people are actually sourcing their food? And what are the energy needs that are going to be associated with that? Any other comments on that? Um, I think one of the things I was a little <laughs> apprehensive about um, when we started talking about the reduction in pollution was that one, it would not be sustainable, right? And so as soon as the economy opened back up, um, we would see the return to the persistent overburdened pollution levels in black, brown, and poor rural communities. Uh, and I think that played out with the COVID um, cases as well. And so there's research out there that shows links to persistent over polluted places and increased cases of COVID. Um, and so it was kind of this dichotomy between, you know, how do we envision this idea of reduced pollution to create a more sustainable and, and um, climate focused society, but at the same time recognizing the impact of this persistence of pollution. Um, and so I was hoping that that discussion never got lost. Um, and I'm still concerned that it may have been lost as we kind of look at cases shifting around the country. Um, but this, this idea that, that communities are overburdened by pollution has detrimental impacts. Um, and we saw that with the early COVID cases. Um, so we talked a little bit about behavior and how behavior might change. I mean, so are we seeing permanent behavior change or are these temporary shifts from each of your perspectives? So will we um, kind of negate any of these impacts in the future? Like, I'm, you know, it's interesting if we change our transportation patterns, is that a permanent change from what we're seeing? Um, and how should, should transit agencies been, be trying to address this or think through this through? Um, could autonomous vehicles help in the future? Like, what are some ideas that you all have? Um, and then we'll have one last question after that. So uh, Paulina, do you want to speak to that one? And then Destiny? That's on term long term behaviors. I think I, I think the question is what what of the things we will that are happening right now will remain true. I mean, there is some discussions that the the shutdowns have shown people that you can actually be productive from work and work from home. Um, you can be productive working from home, and you're saving on. Um, time from commuting and tra energy transportation like cost of, tra of moving around for getting to your work so i do wonder if there's we're going to see an increased um 
telecom teleworking um, after the pandemic, which would have implications for for the energy energy systems if there's more increase. Well, all of these things we've been talking as temporary, are they going to be permanent and what are the implications overall? So I think that is in this reduction in travel that we've seen, um, how long is that going to remain? Is that going to be more long term or are people just going to go back to their tra pre-COVID travel behaviors and drive as much as they drove before? Um, and I, I don't have questions. I don't know that we have I don't have answers. I don't know that anyone has answers for those questions, but I think that's where we're going to see um, like where the behavior really is going to affect things. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of hearing at least about with like long term changes would be like at one point there was like a national shortage of deep freezers and AC units. Right. And so once you make the upfront cost for those um, technologies, there's no need, there's no reason for you to get rid of them, right? So now like the additional like cost of just per unit of energy of using that AC, it's not that much compared to like the upfront cost, like on like, a daily basis. And then, you know, with the deep freezers, like if I had one, I know I would, <laughs> I would continue to use it, right? You're not, there's very few times when you like deplete the entire freezer store of your deep freezer. So you are going to see like a little bit more of an increase in like the residential side. Um, I think that with like these like long term impacts, like one of the things that I was talking with the food bank about were using autonomous vehicles to meet some of the needs of their rural like consumers, right, because it's, it's harder to get volunteers to drive so far out. Mm -hmm. But with AVs, I mean, you know, you can have somebody directing it from the like a center console, they can direct a couple like once you have an established route. Um, it's really just like maintenance. So kind of thinking about how can we use like autonomous technologies to help meet like those needs, um, I think is going to be a long term change that we could see. Um, and then in general, I've been seeing like kind of more of a discussion about like the implications of just like social imbalance and inequity. And I hope that that's like a long term change in the way that people are kind of thinking about the effects of their research. Right, so it's not just about like air quality of low income populations in a vacuum, it's about like air quality and the jobs and the economic implications. And you know, you can't, you're not an expert in all of these things, but you know, you, you can't also silo these things either. And so we should at least like acknowledge that. I'll just add, add one quick thing. Um, there's a lot of privilege that's wrapped up in this idea of working from home. Um, and so when we see these pollution reductions, particularly those that are related to travel, um, because a lot of people in the overpolluted communities are still going to work if they still have a job. And so when you see a big reduction, you just see how, um, uh, how imbalanced the source of pollution in communities um, shows up, right? And so the people polluting in, driving into those communities or through those communities don't necessarily live in those communities while that pollution is being produced there. And so um, I do think, again, it allows us to understand what is the impact of suburbanization, white flight, ra racial residential segregation, um, when it comes to kind of just how the economy operates um, normal. And so I hope that understanding this will allow us to think about that. And, um, you know, we talked about social costs earlier. Is there a way to reformulate the social cost of pollution and um, in communities that are overburdened. And so, I don't know, I feel like this does allow us an opportunity to just really rethink how we um, understand how different people move around this country and, and impact other people that they don't have to think about. So I know that we're at sort of at the end of time. So I want to ask just one more question. And again, I I, um, I think all of the questions that are coming in, um, very very insightful uh, questions, and it shows that we're collectively putting a lot of thought into this very important topic. So um, let's talk for a second about policy, because you know, is there a window, um, or if there is a window um, in 2021 to make some sort of clean energy change? How do we use the moment? What considerations should we be making? Um, what priorities should be set? And should you be thinking about infrastructure jobs in terms of economic stimulus and through what mechanism? So a, a kind of an overarching policy question that leads us to what are some key things that we should be thinking about right now? Um, who'd like to go first? 
Okay, Polly. Yeah, so I actually think there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, so we're dealing with, the country already had an infrastructure crisis before COVID. Uh, we now have an economic crisis with massive unemployment uh, and we have the climate crisis. And so isn't there a saying that don't let any crisis could go to waste? Um, I think, uh, I mean, the, the, the New Deal, not like in the 1930s, right, that really helped the U.S. Um, get, get through the Great Depression was massive investments in infrastructure, which created jobs and also just led to the, like supported the creation of the infrastructure that has led the U.S. to its economic development. So I really do think there might be an opportunity here to start thinking about um, infra massive infrastructure investments that are supporting decarbonization, improving equity, and really leading to job creation. And it isn't just building, supporting renewable energy projects, right? It is, if it is electrification of, of end use, um, end use, end use, like heating and cooking, if it's like electrification of those end uses may be supportive. Massive investments in, in, in revamping properties like buildings. So like energy investments in energy efficiency uh, um, for, for existing buildings, uh, incentives for supporting uh, efficient appliances in, for low income households. Uh, solar, like also just like solar PV, um, investments in electric vehicles, right? If, if, if the, let's say most people already drive uh, short enough distances that electric vehicles make sense, make sense for their daily commutes. And if people are gonna be driving even less than electric vehicles, like the mile, the range issue becomes even less of a problem. So can we be investing in, in electric vehicles? Um, so all of these investments in infrastructure for, and it's just, I mean, all types of infrastructure, but also energy infrastructure and end use at the end use that can help with decarbonization efforts and actually provide economic stimulus and job creation. I think that's where we see a lot of opportunity and where we could be calling on our elected officials to really think structurally about those investments that are that are all of these investments to help the economy revamp and how to make use of that. So I'll just echo what Paulina said um, and kind of like just highlight that we really need like long-term solutions that are you know right now we have a lot of issues in front of us because of COVID and it's really about thinking about how can we have like long-term sustainable um, solutions to these problems. And so making sure that we have like equal access to jobs in these different sectors that are really going to benefit a wide range of the population. Um, we want to make sure that we're not just like putting in like one size fits all solutions because these policy implications will change in urban and rural areas. And so we want to make sure that like nobody's left behind in this energy transition. And so that might be kind of like using AVs to help transport people to work. But like what we're seeing right now is a lot of like using AVs to like make sure like, you know, if people can't go to the food, then the food can come to them. Um, and so there are also like other policy barriers there, like um, for example, with like food stamps, people could not use them online before COVID. And so that actually limits the ability of those populations to actually like order food online, right? Like if I can go into the store and get food for free, why would I order it online even if it has free delivery if I have to pay for it? Um, and so like there are these, again, compounding effects that we need to think about and make sure that we're working at the intersection. And Tony, any last thoughts for today? Yeah, um, as a former practicing civil engineer, I think a lot about infrastructure and, and how we plan infrastructure uh, renewal or revitalization. And so I've been thinking a lot about in this policy window that we may have or that we're having in some states, how do we begin to view housing as infrastructure and do a strategic, like Paulina said, revitalization of housing, whether that's combining energy efficiency, solar, um, and really doing it in a place-based approach. Um, and then you allow communities then, if you, you know, fix a block, 
that block is set for you know the tw next 20 years or next two decades and so how can we use the opportunity if we get some windfall of funding to be strategic be geographic <laughs> be equitable in rolling any of these programs out and i think that's going to be key so collecting data either on the inequities that exist now and data to measure that we are moving forward um, on an equitable path. So uh, with that, um, I feel like we have a, a charge to continue looking at this um, and, and making this as a top of mind um, area of focus. Obviously we have a lot of civil engineers um, in our midst and so there is a lot of infrastructure work that can be done. I want to say a special thank you um, to Tony, to Destiny, and to Paulina today for joining us for this important conversation. We look forward to future conversations about tra transportation and batteries and storage, um, all uh, trying to find the same um, set of positive outcomes for the world. So thank you all very much. And on behalf of Jay Whitaker and myself at the Scott Institute, um, thank you to all of us, all of you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.